everybody. In today's video, we're going to talk about what the acronym FODMAP stands for, what a FODMAP actually is, and what foods are highest in FODMAPs and should be avoided if you're doing the low FODMAP diet. Let's get started. So let's start off with what FODMAP actually stands for, and then we can break this acronym down just a little bit to further our understanding. FODMAP stands for fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And I know that's really a mouthful, but we're going to break this down just so you can get a, a sense for what this is. Fermentable just means that the bacteria in your gut will break this down and utilize it for their food rather than your own. In research, sometimes they will say that a fiber or a resistant starch or a FODMAP escapes digestion. And that means that our digestive juices and our absorption and our processes for dealing with food don't handle some of these. So the contents of the FODMAPs. So fermentable just means food for your bacteria for the most part. Next up, you can see these couple of saccharides. If you just erase the oligo, di, and mono, what you can start to think of just for more simplicity's sake, if you see the word saccharide, or if you see that at the end of another word, you can start to think carbohydrate. Now carbohydrate can mean either the complex carbohydrates that are found in whole grains or something like a potato or a sweet potato, or it can mean a simple sugar. Like sugar is a carbohydrate. Fructose is a carbohydrate. Lactose sugar is a carbohydrate. So once we kind of broaden that understanding, we can see that really it's just three different types of carbohydrate and polyols, all of which are fermentable or eaten up by our gut bacteria. And that's why when we talk about low FODMAP in the context of SIBO, for example, they use the FODMAP diet to starve, and I'm using air quotes, they're using it to starve the SIBO bacteria. Now, the question of whether or not that's a good idea to do and the relevance is really up for grabs. I have several videos on this topic. I'm actually not a fan of the low FODMAP diet for SIBO specifically. So go ahead and check that out in the doobly-doo or I'll try to put a pop-up thingy up here so you can watch that video too. But nonetheless, fermentable carbohydrates largely that are going to be metabolized by your gut bacteria. And if we do the low FODMAP diet, we're going to be reducing the food that the gut bacteria are munching on. Okay, now that we've established what FODMAP stands for and what FODMAPs actually are, we need to cover what foods actually contain FODMAPs. So, okay. So now that we have a bit of a list to go off of, let's talk about what makes up the FODMAP acronym, what foods you're gonna find these in, and then this will have some relevance to your journey when you reintroduce the FODMAPs later on. So first and foremost, let's start with the oligosaccharides, and that can actually be divided into two different categories. You've got your fructans and your goss. And this is going to include a lot of the famous FODMAPs. So things like asparagus, beans and lentils, Brussels sprouts, onion and garlic. I wrote wheat and company because that does encompass barley and rye also, as well as amaranth. Blueberries have a lot of fructan, grapefruit, watermelon, cashews and pistachios. When you come over here to goss, we've got things like butternut squash, yucca or yucca. It's comment below, let me know, is it yucca or yucca? So option number one or option number two, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce that. I always say yucca, but I'm not sure if I'm correct. Anyway, um, yucca, wheat and company, so that would include barley and rye, and almonds make the list for galacto-oligosaccharides. Next up, we have the D in FODMAP, which is the disaccharide. And really what we're talking about here is lactose. Lactose is a two- unit sugar, a disaccharide, and that is going to be found in obviously dairy products. So we're thinking about things like milk, custard and pudding, ice cream, yogurt, frozen yogurt. Now some people actually will debate me on this, whether or not kefir is okay if you are lactose intolerant or doing the low FODMAP diet. All of the lists online and all of the apps say that kefir is a no-go and it's high in lactose, but some people swear up and down that the bacteria in kefir specifically will digest some of the lactose and make it more digestible, and it should be theoretically lower in lactose. I just don't know if I've read anything that really supports that. So let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. But moving on, we also have the monosaccharide. So that is a one unit sugar, and largely we're gonna be talking about fructose. Now, a lot of things we think of are gonna be fruit because it is the fruit sugar, and that would encompass things like apples, cherries, mangoes, and watermelon, but you're also going to find excess, I'm gonna use that in air quotes, you're going to find excess or more than normal amounts of fructose in other foods as well. For example, agave 
honey, and asparagus, although there are a few others. And finally, we come down to the polyols, the last category that stands for the P, and we've got a lot of other really big ones. So we've got apples and avocados. Cherries, you'll notice, makes two categories, as does apple. Stone fruits, that's going to be things like peaches and plums and nectarines and apricots. Those are all stone fruits. Watermelon, cauliflower makes a list for polyols, nothing else. Sweet corn, although some types like baby corn can be okay for the FODMAP diet, but sweet corn on the cob is going to make it into the polyol category. And then finally, some of the artificial sweeteners that end in OL, like mannitol, xylitol, and erythritol are all polyol FODMAPs. Finally, it is worth noting that I made you guys a much more expansive and inclusive list than what I was able to fit on my whiteboard here. If you go to the link in the doobly-doo below, I have created a free downloadable PDF for you guys, and it includes a lot more high FODMAP foods that you need to know about. Particularly, there was a lot more fructan-containing foods that I just wasn't able to fit up on my whiteboard. So do make sure that you download that at the link below and enjoy. Now, I do want to point out that the goal with the low FODMAP diet should be to reintroduce all of these foods at some point back into your world. Now, with the exception of lactose, because lactose intolerance is kind of a separate issue in my mind, all of the rest of these should be able to come back into your diet within the span of a couple of weeks or maybe a few months at most. So I think that everybody should be able to tolerate onion and garlic and Brussels sprouts and apples and avocado, but it just is that the conventional treatment of IBS and the conventional treatment of SIBO is typically not enough to get you to the point where you're able to tolerate these foods again. And for that, I'm actually really excited to introduce, I have created my own online course called FODMAP Freedom in 90 Days. So if you are stuck on the low FODMAP diet or if you're just starting out, this is going to be a DIY treat your own IBS or SIBO or both, depending on your diagnosis. We're gonna talk about things like motility, about the gut-brain axis, about feeding the microbiota, and we're going to work toward getting your tolerance for FODMAPs to increase so that you can safely and without consequences reintroduce the vast majority of these FODMAP foods into your diet and live a normal life. The course is not officially launched yet, but if you go to the other link in the doobly-doo below, I am taking emails so I can let you know when the course is officially launched and you can be one of the first members in. I really hope to see you there and I wish you the best of luck on your FODMAP journey. Please subscribe to my channel. It would mean a lot if you do.